Hello and welcome back to episode 19 where we're going to look at choral recording. Now to set this one into some sort of perspective what we had was an opportunity to record a choir and they've allowed me to take some clips and use them to explain here the different techniques we can use to record a choir in stereo in a church. Hello and today we're in St Mary's Church in a little town called Halesworth, which is in Suffolk, uh, on the east coast of the UK. And the church that we're going to be recording in this evening, I've never been to before, and it's remarkably spacious, and it's got a pretty moderate acoustic. So you can have a look around and see what's going. The organ looks to be extremely interesting. Considering that we're actually in a fairly small market town, a three manual organ of this kind is a little bit large for the venue, I would have thought. But you can see that this will be the area where the majority of the choir is going to be set up, I think. But as there's nobody here at the moment, I'm actually guessing a little. I'm going to be putting my array on that stand that's behind me. So there's going to be an array on there and then for one of the other experiments I'm going to do I'm going to put an AB pair uh, either side so we get a, an idea of a spaced pair in this acoustic. The, the one thing that does worry me slightly is that in the modernization of this church they've taken all the old pews out placed them with seats and they've put a suspended floor which is a timber construction. And as I've walked along, uh, it creaks. So if we do any recordings and people do a late entry or something like that, then we're gonna have a small snag, I think, because it creaks like mad. But from the position where the microphone stand in the center is, it's right behind the conductor's podium that's been set up. So hopefully this gives you a bit of a clue as to what the environment of the place is like. Um, moderate acoustics, it's not a, a very reverberant, but I think it will sound quite nice for the choir in here. Although I think that organ might well be a little bit too potent, but we'll see. That's one of the things with these recordings, you never really know in advance, do you? Anyway, more a bit later. Right, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but the, uh, the conductor has moved everything with we planned where people were going to be and the conductor has uh, moved them slightly. I think it'll still be okay. Um, but what we've actually got is the, <laughs> the, large, the large mic stand in the middle, uh, which caused, of course, horror uh, when they actually saw, this. is that going to stay there? Um, yes. So it's always well worth, even if you've told them, tell them again. Yeah. Well, we're back in the warm and the recording's over and it's been quite successful. Uh, the choir are going to get a nice recording of their performance um, and I've got some interesting bits of video and some interesting audio clips for you to listen to on here. I am going to add for them some extra reverb uh, because I want it to sound just a little bit fuller than it is. But for this particular video, we're going to listen to it exactly as recorded, uh, nothing added whatsoever. So there's no, there's no compression, no processing of any kind. And what we've actually got is exactly what was recorded. Now, just to make sure you understand what we did do, we did a, a rehearsal session followed by a public performance. And the version that is the finished one is from the public performance. Microphone wise, we've got a pair of Octava MK319s, they're cardioids, so they're operating in AB mode. We've got a pair of AKG 414s operating in cardioid mode, so that's our XY pair. 
and then we've got an MS pair made up of the mid microphone being a TLM 103 and the side component is provided by Norman U87. I used those in the rehearsals and I think the acoustic was a little too dry for the XY pair to sound as good as they could do. So I changed the XY mode into Blumland stereo by setting both of the 414s to figure eight mode. What it means is that we have some recordings from the rehearsal that are just going to be for monitoring purposes and we can listen to some of those and the actual files that I've recorded from the evening version where we had an audience are in Blumlin Stereo and I think they're the ones that I'm going to use for the choir's actual recording. Uh, I won't be using any of the MS and I won't be using the uh, space mics at the front, the AB pair. The Blumlin Stereo, to my ears, does seem to be the best of the lot. Uh, I didn't actually expect the Blumlin Stereo to be the best. I don't normally use that technique. I, I do normally use XY. But I think in this particular example, uh, the experiment to use Blumlin Stereo paid off and it's a much fuller sound. Now, one of the other things I've done is set Cubase up with a stereoscope. And in the background, you can see that we've actually got a vertical spike that's coming up from the one mic here, the SM7B, because we're recording in glorious mono, so there is no width component. But you can see when we play some clips how the spectral display changes between the different formats. What we've actually got is recorded into Cubase um, a clip from the rehearsal using XY on the 414s. That's immediately followed by the 414s set to Blumlin stereo, so they're both on figure eight. After that comes the space pair with the 319s. And finally, you'll see uh, on the screen there's three tracks of the MS microphone pair. Now, for those that don't quite understand how the MS thing works, uh, to make it work and decode the stereo from the mid track and the side track, all we've actually got to do is duplicate the side track and then invert the polarity on one of them and then pan the first one left and the second one right. Um, and in Cubase, I just gang up the two faders so that the mid channel is on its own and the side channel, the two faders, go up and down together. And on the demo track, what I've actually done, I've duplicated the very last segment, started it in mono, brought in the side channel to give stereo, and then faded the side channel back out again. So you can hear that go from mono to stereo, back from stereo to mono. And you can also see it on the screen and see the spectral content of the stereo field. So it might be a really useful experiment. If you've never seen a stereo display before, it's well worth using them. And most DAWs have got some sort of facility for letting you see the spectral content of the stereo field. And it's well worth experimenting with because seeing it and hearing it sort of link together and then you get a better idea of what exactly the stereo content of your recordings actually is. There's obviously giveaways. Um, Something that's only on the left will be a diagonal line that way. Something that's only on the right hand channel will have a diagonal line the other way. Um, and mono is bang up right in the middle. Um, in normal stereo recordings, what you see is a swirly mess. But once you get used to what it should look like, you can actually spot all sorts of things. Uh, and in the recording that we made, the side channel and the front channel uh, I've got deliberately set with the side a little bit higher than the front. The side channel information should really be a bit lower, but I've deliberately left it at the exact same level as the front channel so you can see and hear the result that gives. The choir are the Pakefield singers and we're using their concert performance as some of the material for this video. Uh, it's a bit of an experiment for me 
and they get the recording of course that we've actually finished and they can put it on their website and use it for their own purposes it works quite well for both of us uh, what we've got is sopranos altos tenors and basses and they're in the choir stalls and on their right hand side they've actually got the organist and the body of the organ and I'm not sure if you know too much about church organs but very often what you see those decorative pipes they're actually not really where most of the sound comes from in this particular organ quite a lot of the flute stops are actually situated out the back uh, and in this particular church in an area that's been converted into an office of all things um, I set up my recording equipment uh, in that side of the church near the office and once the organ started to play all I can hear are the flute stops uh, when he's using some of the other pipes uh, those ranks are in a different place altogether so it was, it was much more peaceful where I was sitting but as soon as he plays the bits with the flute stops it got extremely loud what this means is that in churches the stereo field is quite distorted we've got the choir in the center spread out a little bit so the sopranos altos tenors and basses have width and then we've got an organ the organ has its ranks of pipes in various places so some of them face the choir and some of them face along the church so the stereo field changes during the actual performance as the organist plays the different ranks of pipes all of this in a church means that the sound from the organ goes up into the roof goes up into the side aisles and swirls around and gives that very rich organ like tone that we know from recordings but it's a bit of a gamble because until you actually hear it you won't know what it sounds like uh, the state of organs is always variable some of them have been well maintained and looked after despite the fact that many are over 100 years old but they're still working it's actually quite common to find some that have flaws some of them are in serious need of tuning some of them have the occasional note that gets stuck uh, and indeed this particular organ when they first turned it on made a very strange honking sound and everybody looked at each other thinking what on earth is that but it turned out it was just a, a stuck pipe once the pressure built built up the actual little valve on the pipe closed and it became silent but it was a bit of a worry until it became silent we didn't quite know what was going on so we've got our choir and we've got the organ we also in this recording have people people are a pain because uh, during this 75 minute performance uh, it didn't happen until well so it's 75 minutes from end to end uh, at least two phones uh, had text messages come through and that happened in the pauses between the sections of the music so we've actually got boop, 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 and all sorts of things uh, it's quite normal and you don't really have much you can do about it there's no real way that you can in a church yell at people and tell them to turn their phones off before the performance it just isn't going to happen so if you are looking for a recording that is controlled do not do it with an audience in this particular one they wanted to record it with the audience uh, which is quite nice and I think the, the people in the choir and the people who came to the performance if they actually listen to the recording they'll remember them being there while it was recorded but if you're looking for something that's controlled that has absolute silence at the end of the pieces and the reverb dies away to nothing at all that sounds wonderful but you can't do it if there's people there you have to do it as an isolated performance so what have we got we've got a recording that sounds like a real public performance there are coughs there are the occasional phone making a noise and there's nothing we can do about that so we need to just embrace it and take it on exactly what it is a real performance with people in the audience but this recording we had 160 people and I think they did amazingly well to remain as quiet as they did 
The telephone noises, well, that's just part and parcel of a live recording, isn't it, nowadays? Uh, if we don't want that, we've got to get rid of the audience. But we wanted the audience, so what we've got is a realistic capture of a real event. For my money, the Blumlin stereo is the one that actually pipped the other techniques. Uh, I'm not keen on the mid-side recording. Uh, I know it's got lots of benefits and you can adjust the stereo width afterwards, but I just like the Blumlin stereo. I think in this particular venue it worked quite nicely. <laughs> the width so the, it will start in mono go into stereo go back to mono
You've now heard XY, AB, Blumlin Stereo and MS, all on a choir, all in a fairly large church, singing some traditional music with a fairly mixed ability choir. I think we've done a reasonable job on this one and if you do it, you've now perhaps got a slightly better idea of the sound you're going to get if you start to experiment with some of these different mic techniques. All these mic techniques have definitely got a place in recording. In this particular one, we have a couple of sections where soloists come forward from the body of the choir. And luckily, the two spaced microphones were in exactly the right place. I wasn't aware that this was going to happen. Nobody had mentioned that anybody was going to get up and physically move. What have we learned? Well, in this particular church, with less reverberant acoustics than I'd thought, the XY pair was simply a little bit too dry. Uh, it would be quite recoverable with the addition of artificial reverb, whereas the Blumlin stereo pair has got a fuller sound without having to treat it. So the Blumlin stereo, with its recording of the natural ambience, has done better than the XY pair has. MS, just, I think, the wrong position for the MS microphone to do well. If we could have got the MS pair nearer to the choir, I think it would have performed better. The space pair performed really well, simply because we didn't know that we were going to have some movement within the choir and soloists were going to come closer to the audience and do their particular solos in that place. I'm not sure that the level of complexity of the actual equipment we use for this one would be something I'd want to repeat, but I definitely would use the Blumlin again. And I think if I'd got channel spare, which I normally have, Blumlin plus a spaced pair gives a real variety of options. If I'd recorded this just in XY, it would have not been as nice. Um, if I'd recorded the whole thing in the spaced pair mode, uh, then when they were in the choir stalls, the result was a little bit lacking definition. The MS pair, just in the wrong place, I think, really. Uh, I could have done better with that. For some of you, this might be your first experience of MS and your first experience of XY versus a spaced pair. And I guess some of you won't have heard Blumlin stereo before. So now with this particular video, you've got four different recording modes covered and maybe you can choose one that will work for your particular circumstances. I hope so. See you in the next video. Take care. Look after yourselves.